IPM, Integrated Pest Management Program, uses prevention measures to keep pests from entering the operation, uses control measures to eliminate any pests that get inside, and you're advised to work closely with a licensed pet pest control operator, a PCO. Three roles of integrated pest management. Deny pests access to the, to the operation. You're going to make sure all your holes and clean are, cl are closed up. Deny pests food and shelter. You don't have stuff laying around that they can get into. And work with a licensed PCO to eliminate pests that do enter. So, of course, you want to use uh, approved reputable suppliers and check deliveries before they enter. If, you're, if you see, um, if they see a box that's got webbing and stuff on it, they're going to want to refuse that. For one reason, it's you're bringing in bugs into the facility. And for the other reason, it's you've got a food product that's probably contaminated. Uh, you want to keep pests from entering through openings of the building. You have screen windows and vents. Uh, Self-closing doors, door sweeps, that's like underneath the, um, the, the bottom of the door to kind of anything, to kind of keep things out. And it sweeps kind of a, I don't know how to, like a little curtain, <laughs> okay? Um, and air curtains on doors. Have y'all seen an air curtain before where you, like when you open the door and you feel this breeze coming down like that? Okay, well that's to keep the flies from flying through when you're walking through that door because it stops them because they just have little wings, you know, so they're, that big blast of air is supposed to keep them out unless it's not working correctly. <laughs> so then you, then they can just sail right through. Um, keep exterior open openings clo tightly closed. Um, to keep them from coming through openings in the building, they'll use uh, filling, like that styrofoam spray stuff to put around the pipes, around the holes. Cover the, cover the drains with grates, which is helpful, but some of those floor drains look pretty big to me. I think a lot of stuff could come up through there. Um, seal cracks in floors, walls, and around equipment. To the not to deny pests food and shelter, you want to dispose of garbage quickly quick and correctly. You don't want to leave the garbage sitting in the kitchen overnight because that's just like a buffet waiting to happen. Uh, keep containers clean. Keep outdoor containers tightly covered and clean up spills and around containers immediately and wash and rinse containers often. And when they say containers, they're talking about uh, the garbage containers usually. Of course, everything else needs to be kept clean too. Again, to deny pest food and shelter, store recyclables correctly. They have to be in clean, pest-proof containers and in containers as far away from the building as regulations allow. Store food and supplies quickly and correctly. Keep them away from the walls and at least six inches off the floor. And rotate food so pests can't settle in them and, and breed. Uh, and clean the facility thoroughly. Clean up food and beverage spills immediately. Clean toilets and restrooms as needed. Train staff to keep lockers and break room areas clean. I mean, if those are, you, you could have a great kitchen and right next door you've got food wrappers and potato chips and things all over the floor, that would be inviting. And then all they have to do is go next door to your kitchen. Uh, keep cleaning tools and supplies clean and dry and empty water from buckets to keep from attracting rodents because they're going to like that water. Um, one of the reasons for having the, the shelving six inches off the floor so you can get underneath there with your broom, get underneath there with your, with your mop. Because if you don't, if they don't sweep under there periodically, trash starts to build up underneath those shelves. And that's a perfect place for a little rat or a little mouse to take up housekeeping because it's right there and it's right by the food supply and they'll just, they could be living right there sleeping during the daytime and never being bothered if they don't come and sweep the floor. <laughs> so, cockroaches. The problem with them, besides, you know, they carry pathogens. They live and breed in places that are dark, warm, most moist, and hard to clean. 
uh, and if you see them in daylight, you've got may have a real problem. Either that, or the pest control man was there the night before, and he's totally dazed and confused and wandering around. So, another thing is, if you smell a very strong, oily smell, uh, that can indicate a, a roach infestation. Okay, there you go. Strong, signs of cockroach infestation include a strong, oily odor, droppings, which are their feces that look like little grains of black pepper, uh, capsule-shaped egg cases that may be brown, dark red, or black, and they're kind of a leathery appearance and smooth. So, if you have a drain board, look under that periodically. Make sure you don't have any of that stuff under there because that's a place where they would like to hide. So you just need to keep that clean and dry. Signs of a rodent infestation include gnaw marks, droppings, sh uh, they're shiny black if they're fresh and gray if they're old, uh, dirt tracks along the walls. They don't have really good eyesight, so when they go, they kind of like lean, they kind of kind of hug the walls too. Uh, nests can be made out of cloth, hair, feathers, grass, scraps of paper, uh, in quiet places, near food and water, and next to buildings. And before choosing a PCO, they need to check the references, make sure the PCO is licensed, uh, if required by the state, and require a written contract outlining the work to be performed. So if you have an issue with a pest, with any pests in the facility, you can ask, you know, after you've made your observations and got some interviews, you can request to see the, uh, their contract, their pest control contract, and also see any uh, monthly or weekly service call records they may have. Because there'll they'll be, they'll be something that shows, them what they, shows what they did each time they came. And there's probably a book, uh, a pest control book, where if anybody sees something like sees roaches or sees ants or something, it's it's like almost like a log, so that the pest control guy can check that when he comes. And sometimes they'll have a in their contract that if they have something like ants or something like that, that they can call and they'll come out within the next 24 hours or something. All right. Using and storing pesticides. This is one of the main reasons why you want to have a pest control operator, because you do not want staff using pesticides when they may or may not know the proper way to use them, because you can poison somebody. Um, pesticides should be applied when uh, the kitchen's closed for business. And now, a nursing home, you're always going to have staff on site. It's always going to be someone there. Uh, remove any food and movable food contact surfaces. Um, cover equipment and, non and food contact surfaces that can't be moved. And of course, afterwards, wash, rinse, and sanitize food contact surfaces. Uh, if pesticides will be stored on the premises, they have to be kept in their original containers, stored in a secure location away from food, utensils, and equipment, and disposed of per manufacturer's directions, and they should have an MS DS sheet on the premises. That's it for that. Any questions about that? And you, I remember one time they had a, they talked about this, uh, this one facility said that they had seen a rat in the facility. And I'm like, you know, we're like going, oh my gosh. So we're looking around, we couldn't find anybody that had actually seen this rat. So I got there early one morning, I'm sitting there, and I'm watching, just sitting out there drinking my coffee, and this little rat, they had all this pine straw around the trees, <laughs> and this little rat came zipping out and went over and did something and zipped back in, then zipped out, went back in, and I, I was a very industrious little rat. Never went inside the building for, as far as I could tell, but I'm like going, well. <laughs> but we never saw him go in, but I did tell the facility about it, so I, I find the, felt a little bad about it because she was very industrious. <laughs> But it was, you know, you just can't have that that close to the, you, to the to a nursing home. That's not bad. And that's why with the dumpsters and stuff, you, it doesn't take much to attract a, a rat. And then the next thing you know, they're coming in the back door. 
uh, government, government agencies are responsible in assisting in preventing foodborne illness. Uh, that would be the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, the U.S. Public Health Service, PHS, and state and local regulatory authorities. So that would be like the Alabama County Health Departments and the Alabama State Health Department, which we, which we are a part. Okay, the FDA Food Code. Uh, you hear me talking about that. Um, I believe it comes out every four years. Yes, every four years. Um, usually it's late, though, coming out. Every four or five years. The FDA Food Code outlines federal recommendations for food safety regulations for the food service industry. Those are recommendations. They're created for city, county, state, and tribal agencies. And although the FDA recommends adoption by each state, it cannot require it. Now, CMS does recognize the Food Code as a standard to be used in evaluating the kitchen. Now, state and local control, your regulatory authorities write or adopt food codes that regulate retail and food service operations. And food codes can differ widely by state or locality. Um, and in large cities, the local regulatory authority will probably res be responsible for enforcing requirements. So if you're like in Chicago, I'm sure there's probably, you know, the city of Chicago has re requirements that they enforce. Um, there are... The food code a lot of times will let you know, will mention if, if there might be a, a, a deviation uh, in, by local authorities. Like, for example, the plumbing I talked about, the type of types of drains, it has a caveat there that says, you know, certain other things can be done. It depends upon the regulations by the local health, health department. Okay, in smaller cities or rural areas, the county or state regulatory authority may be responsible. And, of course, they also may conduct. You, you'll find where the um, county health department has probably come through a lot of these nursing home facilities. They may have something posted. And it's always good to kind of look at that and see what they, say, what they found and see if that's still the case. Food, for food service inspections are required for all operations. Um, it's often based on the five CDC risk factors and the FDA public health interventions. They'll have like a, a standardized sheet that they check off. And they'll have like critical uh, concerns. Risk designations for evaluating facilities, they have provi priority items to prevent, eliminate, or reduce hazards, such as hand washing. Priority foundation items that support those priority items, like soap at the hand washing station, and towels, working sink, and then core items rela that relate to general sanitation in the facility, equipment design, general maintenance, things like that, like keeping your equipment repaired, especially if it's something like a freezer or a walk-in refrigerator should be working if you're using it. Um, inspection guidelines, they're going to ask for, well, what, when we go in, we definitely identify ourselves, and you always wear your name tag. Um, this is the way they look at you, okay? You ask, they ask for identification, or unless you provide it. They, you want to cooperate with the inspector. Take notes. They're going to be taking notes just like you're taking notes so they'll know what you're looking at. Be professional. Uh, be prepared to provide requested records. Discuss violations and time frames for correction. Well, that's a little more with the health inspectors. But, yeah, that would be us too. Uh, act on all deficiencies noted in the report. Because we give them a report if we, if we write a deficiency. It's part of the... It's the, the uh, the, the deficiency report we give to the entire facility, so they get a copy of that. Uh, an operation may be closed. Now, this is really your health department, but 
we had a, we've had some interesting situations like this. Uh, significant lack of refrigeration, backup of sewage into the operation, emergencies such as a fire or flood, significant pest infestation, long interruption of electrical or water surface, clear evidence of a foodborne illness outbreak related to the operation. So those are just some examples. Um, we walked into one place and it, the refrigeration was so bad that the jello was melting. They couldn't get the jello to gel. I mean, the refrigerator, the refrigerator was, I think it was in the 50s. I did not, I was not inspecting the kitchen on that one. Someone else we know was. <laughs> so, <laughs> she did an excellent job. Um, benefits of self-inspections. Safer, safer food, improved food quality, cleaner environment for staff and customers, higher inspection scores, which is always encouraging. Um, and of course, they should be doing their own self-inspections using the same type of checklist because they know what you're looking for. They should be going through there and identifying any risks to food safety and then meet with the staff and determine how to correct those problems. Staff food safety training. And we're going to be looking at this from our perspective, but the management um, is going to be wanting to train their staff to provide what the staff needs to know versus what they actually do know. Um, and you can identify this by observing their performance on the job. And that's what we're doing. We're observing their performance on the job. Uh, testing their knowledge of food safety and, and identifying any areas of weakness that they may have. Um, if you see, for example, somebody making puree food, ideally with pu puree food, you can put the food in the blender, maybe add s some liquid, but you don't have to add a whole lot. But if you see someone adding a whole bunch of liquid and then a whole bunch of thickener and then add more liquid, and it just, th that's not, they don't really know what they're doing. Um, and then that's when you start asking, the manager, is there a recipe for puree food <laughs> production? You know, something like that. Um, but if you want to watch them and write down what they're doing, like it's like, how much, so about how much water are you putting in there? Oh, about a quart. And this is for how many servings? Uh, you know, 10 servings of ground beef or whatever. That's a, no, that's way too much. Okay. Um, training staff, training and monitoring. Staff should be trained to follow food safety procedures to provide uh, initial and ongoing training should be provided. And all staff, everybody, including uh, the people that run the dish machine, that run, you know, that clean the, the floors or take out the trash, should have general food safety knowledge. Uh, and then specific jobs should get specific tr safety training. And uh, there should be regular training and then they should be monitored, um, the staff should be monitored to make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the training, any training that's done should be documented. Some people are better with saving all those papers than others, you know. It's, that's a job just doing that, just documenting training. Because usually they'll have a book with all their training for the year. And any training that they've given to someone upon hire, they'll have that in their file. Staff members in, in food service should receive training in good personal hygiene, how and when to wash hands, uh, hair can, other hair, hand care guidelines like fingernail length, nail polish, how to cover wounds, correct work attire, and how to report an illness, or to report an illness for that matter. They should also receive training in controlling time and temperature, TCS food or potentially hazardous food, how to measure the temperature of food, holding and storing TCS food, how to label food for storage. They need, they should know that it has to have a use by date on that food if it's going to be kept in the facility for longer than 
24 hours, right? If they've just made something for lunch, they don't have to mark all those little things of, of coleslaw. Hopefully all those coleslaw items that they mixed together in the morning were kept in the refrigerator so they were all nice and cold by the time lunch time, time came around. Uh, they also should be aware of temperature requirements when thawing, cooling, cooking, cooling, and reheating food. Especially if they're involved um, in, as a cook. Staff members should also receive training in preventing cross-contamination during storage and food preparation, preventing cross-contamination when storing utensils and equipment, what to do if cross-contamination happens, what to do for people who have food allergies. And sometimes you have these little people in, in the nursing home, they'll come right up to the kitchen door and they want such and such. Well, it's their home, you know, and so that person hopefully knows who that is. If they're doing this on a regular basis, they're going to know who that is. And they'll check and make sure they can have it. Uh, staff members should receive training in cleaning and sanitizing, how and when to clean and sanitize, the correct way to wash dishes in a three-compartment sink, and how to wash dishes correctly in a dishwasher. How to handle cleaning tools and supplies. How to handle garbage. How to spot pests. If they see something unusual, what do they do about it? There are many ways to train. You can do on-the-job training. The only thing is with that, if, you, like, if they pair somebody up with someone, which is a usual way of training in the kitchen, they usually put somebody with them. I'm going to put you with... Hilda, for three days, she knows everything. We put her with Hilda. Well, poor Hilda's trying to make lunch and do everything else. And so she's, some of you, they're getting it by observing. Some of them are getting it from what Hilda tells them. And some things Hilda doesn't know or hadn't thought about it in the last 50 years because she does it autopilot. So there's on-the-job training. There's classroom training. Uh, there's in classroom, they can do go, you know, role play, games, whatever, training videos things like we're doing right now, <laughs> okay. Um, methods can be technology-based online, or they can be uh, in different work locations. Uh, it may be that it's too costly to bring staff to the same place. And some people just need to learn at their own pace. 